Hello, DrupalCon. I've traveled a really long way to be here. I had seven hours sat in my ass in Newark Airport. It was rubbish. But I'm here now and I'm very excited. So let's get this presentation started, shall we? All right then. So, hi. Uh, my name is Rally Annette Baker. I am a content strategist. Things you should know about me. I don't really use Drupal. Not because I don't want to, and we're going to get a little more into that. I like Drupal a lot when I do get to use it, but I don't get to use it very often. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about content strategy, the RPG, the role-playing game, and a little bit about where I see stuff going for you guys and for me in the future, which will sit somewhere between, if you were in here for Jeff Eaton's presentation, you'll have a little bit of that in there, and if you're going to attend Cara McGrain's uh, keynote tomorrow, and you should, uh, there'll be a little bit of that in there as well. But we're going to be talking about content strategy in practical terms for you guys. Okay, so uh, I currently work for the Ministry of Justice in London, which is a government department. So um, I deal with some really difficult content. Like on a scale of difficult to difficult, I have to go see the um, Lord Justice and present stuff to him. <laughs> for approval for the website. So I know about tricky sign-off. Um, so what do I do when I'm not doing that? Well, I play games a lot. Um, and so as a result of that, I use game analogies a lot. I also have two small boys uh, who are uh, six and three. So I play a lot of Lego <clears throat> and things like that as well, which we'll see. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about games today, but not gamification, which is rancid bullshit. <laughs> um, I mean, sorry. <clears throat> is, I think, a misguided way of attempting to solve difficult problems, uh, but more about real puzzle solving. So games are a replication of interactions. Within a game environment, within that game universe, you have set rules, and you know what those rules are, and you know what the goal is, and you know how you're meant to get to the goal. Even something as si simple as a game of conquers or kicking a ball around lives within this small area that you're going to interact with and do things with. And part of the reason you know whether you're doing good or bad in a game is a thing called feedback loops. Feedback loops are awesome when it comes to content. Feedback lo loops in content are the sort of things that allow us to understand whether we've managed to input our credit card correctly and whether we've managed to buy something nicely, right? And those are the kind of feedback loops that really interest me in this kind of stuff because they're the conversation between you and the customer. And that conversation between you and the customer is what gets you paid. This is great, because money is fantastic. I know we're in Portland, and that's not a cool thing to say, but, you know, for those of us that like to pay rent and stuff. Okay, so one of the things that I got into this when I was fiddling around with game systems and so on, and thinking about the things that games did really well, was thinking about this interaction copy and error messages and things that went backwards and forwards a lot between you and the customer. And I thought, where has done this well? And I thought of RPG systems. Specifically, I thought of the uh, Neverwinter Nights Aurora system. If any of you have fiddled around with game design at all, you've probably run into it. Um, and playing around with that and thinking about the branching of decisions and uh, the conversations that you have between you and a non-player character, um, and you do something, they respond, and how that's called up from that um, game system led me to this talk in a roundabout way, because essentially I'm an enormous nerd. Okay, and theoretically, if you follow me on Twitter, that's Relly AB, you should get footnotes from Twitter. I can't promise they'll be as useful as Jeff Eaton's. Some of them do just involve animated GIFs, but they're very cool. All right. So the other thing I should tell you is I have some lovely, gorgeous, cuddly Drupal best friends. Uh, that is Lullabot, Eyesight Design, and Decent Online, who all each chipped in $500 to have me come here and stand in front of you and give this talk, because they thought it was really important that more people from outside of Drupal specifically related to content, had the opportunity to come say, say to you what it's like on the other side of the fence. So, yay them! <laughs> oh yeah. 
Also, on top of that, I did have a range of friends and colleagues and old clients who all chipped in sort of $10, $20 each to bring me up to the total amount that it cost me to come here. So um, that was pretty awesome. Anyway, on with the RPG. So does anyone recognize these characters? Okay. This is a, a, a very lovely watercolor style fan art from Dungeons and Dragons, the TV show. Um, and I sometimes think of uh, that <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, the TV show, and content strategy are closely related. <laughs> so why do I think this? Because content strategy as a concept promises a lot. Or rather, if content strategy was as marvelous as it is spouted to be, it would be as good as Dungeons and Dragons, the, the TV show. Not least because in Dungeons and Dragons, the TV show, they got a baby unicorn in the first episode. If someone handed me a baby unicorn, that would be it, game over. <laughs> like, I have got everything I want out of life. Why would I ever, why am I gonna go play this stupid walking around trying to kill things, right? That, I've got baby unicorn, I'm all good, we're fine. So, content strategy is not effortless, unfortunately. There is no button, I don't know whether Drupal 8 is planning to have one, but so far I have not seen a, a button in any CMS that's like, hit this, content strategy. Boom, done, we know what we're doing. In fact, a lot of the difficult conversations about what we're doing with our content exists around this. It's not one size fits all. It's not easy to plan and work out what we're gonna do. It's not infallible. It's not the smiling girl with a laptop on the hillside that agencies love to have sort of on top of their sites when they talk about doing content. Who, it's like, no, actually I'm talking to the wrong audience because you guys probably have sat on top of a hillside and edited a site, but who generally sits on top of a hillside editing a site? It doesn't happen, right? So I think content strategy is actually more like this. And more than that, I think it's better like this. It's still evolving. You can't know it all. You, you can get good at the bits that you like. You draw your map. You plan your campaign. You work out what it is that you want to do next. You test it. You try it out. You fall in a pit of acid. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, if, if I was Mr. Burns, I would be steepling my fingers at this point and saying, excellent, because content strategy is such a huge thing now, and there's no way that it can't be. It touches so many different topics that it means I can go, I'm really good at this bit, but I'm bollocks at this bit, so I'm going to get someone in to do this, and it's still going to be a content strategy. So while you have um, people like me who are general content strategists, I know exactly when I need to pull someone in and go, I'm not good enough at this data visualization stuff and I need someone to come in and help me. So because we've reached that point as a, as a community, if you like, uh, we're pretty free and easy to go, I don't, this means nothing to me, I'm gonna get someone to do it, which is really useful because how many times have you been with a client and they've expected you to know everything about everything? You walk in and literally it's a case where they're going, so I've just had an idea, I think we should do <laughs> And you're sure they've said words, but you can't pass what they are. And you're like there with your mobile going, I'm just going to look up and see in my calendar. <laughs> no idea what that is. Okay, yes, I'm sure we can do that. Maybe we could just maybe talk about this on Monday a little bit. But that's okay for us. So once we've accepted that we can't learn everything about content in one go, then we have to accept, you know, what are we going to do next? So how has content worked so far? Well. I think so far we've had a pretty good grip, grip on how this whole web thing works. So a site is made and it's a repository of stuff. Uh, someone writes up some more stuff, uh, usually directly into the CMS, making full use of that WYSIWYG. Uh, then they choose a snazzy typeface, <laughs> check it out on the preview button, and an internet happens. And of course, that process is repeated over and over and over <laughs> until you have a website. So this is the Winchester Mystery House in, uh, in San Jose. And uh, hopefully if you, you've got the Twitter, you'll get uh, the link to the Wikipedia article. It's like in incredibly bonkers, but the short version is that Sarah Winchester was the heir to the Winchester Rifles fortune. And she felt a bit bad that lots of people had been shot with the Winchester rifles in, in, uh, in the time of her daddy and her husband. So when she inherited all this money, she thought, hmm, I feel quite bad about this. What can I do? I could donate it to charity, or I could keep building a big-ass house for the rest of my life and remodel it and restructure it 
forever so that the ghosts of the Winchester rifle deaths don't come after me. That's what she proceeded to do. So she built, and she built, and she built. And she had a foreman whose job it was specifically to basically live with her and wake up in the morning and say, so Mrs. Winchester, what should we build next? And so they built this. And she was so obsessed with this concept of being chased around by ghosts that the, the house is literally built to be confusing. It's not just an accident that they reached this, although some of that is certainly due to the building and rebuilding that went on. But there is outside a door that is a road to nowhere. It even says it underneath, you can see it here. But, and so you open it up and you're four floors up and you would just sort of plummet to your death. Um, another one to join the ghost crew, I assume. So the Winchester Mystery House is piled higgledy-piggledy. It's remade, it's remoulded, it's been made by multiple makers with little to no plan, no real measurement of success. Is this sounding familiar in any way, shape or form? <laughs> Have I dragged this analogy out to its inevitable conclusion? Right, so this is what our websites are currently like because we've built mainly for the desktop and now, you know, fine. And then someone, some absolute fucker went, you know what I've got, I've got a mobile phone. Why, you know what would be cool? Let's see the web on my mobile so I can be an asshole at weddings, on the beach, <laughs> on a speedboat. <laughs> Basically, you can be an ass on the web everywhere now, right? And we like to pretend, pretend this has come as a big surprise to us, but I don't know about you, I had devices that would connect to the web and pull things up in about 2001 in a different variety of ways. So it hasn't really crept up on us as much as we'd like to think, but you know, the time for talking about it has passed. You know, we have inside car mounts with enormous bricks. We now can see the web pretty much anywhere. So where does that leave our content? Suddenly, this is our content. All these bricks and mortars that were made to build a singular house have to go all these, to all these other places. And our content creators and our content systems are not ready for this. We are literally shitting bricks. <laughs> I misused the word literally there, but I thought it worked. <laughs> <clears throat> it's okay though, because the designer drew something up nice in Helvetta, Helvetica threw together the Twitter bootstrap and created a mobile light version of the site. So everything will probably be fine for the next few years, right? We've got loads of time to plan this, right? Yeah, maybe not. So what happens next is the CEO gets out his crystal ball and decides that he's going to work out or she's going to work out what's happening next. Good luck with that. If we based our thinking on previous predictions, we would have all made proprietary apps for our fridges to tell us when we're out of milk. Ah, the ubiquitous internet fridge. The internet fridge is a hilarious concept and it's one that's been touted for year years. In fact, there is a Tumblr called Fuck Yeah Internet Fridge, which uh, goes through different press releases and so on from decades back, uh, pulling up stuff where you can go see this, um, including this, uh, which is, this is actually taken from a talk that, again, I've linked to on Twitter, and when you get the slides, you'll see it, by Tom Coates, uh, a talk called Mind the Product. And in this, he, he has this picture from um, fuck yeah, internet fridge that was taken from a um, expo, web, uh, technology expo that happened in California a few years ago. And on it, they were proudly displaying that you could pull up Epicurious and other bits and pieces like that, and Twitter. And someone has put on this note here that you can't see why the fuck does my fridge need Twitter? <laughs> Which is true. At this point, who buys an internet fridge and doesn't already own a tablet? Who goes, I've got an iPad, but I'd rather listen to music on my fridge? <laughs> Just doesn't happen. Also, the people that come up with the idea of internet fridges have not thought about people, uh, like, presumably they've never cooked in their lives, because you stand away from the fridge in front of the oven when you're cooking, and turning round to look at the video of the recipe paying behind you is just not how people work, which is why they have an iPad sat in front of them, right? That kind of stuff. So we don't really know how things are going to go. And if you want to see a real golden time capsule of that, Google the phrase, the iPhone will fail. And you will see many, many articles from around 2007 from technology blogs that have 
lived and prospered nonetheless, predicting why the iPhone will fail. Because what they saw was an, saw was an extremely expensive smartphone. And what the iPhone is, and other smartphones like it, is a really cheap computer that people can carry around and do things on them. And that's what they expect, to be able to do all this stuff. OK, so that's given you a little bit of background to where we're going with this. So here's our designer again. What I'd really like you to notice, though, is that he is a Playmobil person. Um, a while ago, I converted a Playmobil school set into a design studio uh, with some cunning tiny, tiny posters and graphics like this um, because I was using it for a photo sh shoot for something else and also because I'm a huge Playmobil nerd because it's so cute and tiny. Um, but the moulding is set with Playmobil. There's no way you can build and rebuild with that. There was, you know, I couldn't pick up a zoo set and go, right, I'm going to turn this into a design studio. I had to look at the closest thing and then what I could do to adapt it. It was a fudge. Playmobil is highly detailed, which is one of the reasons I'm a big geek about it. But it is what it is. Lego, on the other hand, is a smart structural system. It is built to combine in infinite ways. Here's the patent drawing for the original eight stud, stud brick filled in 1958. If you've ever wondered why Lego is so expensive compared to other toys, it's because of their low tolerance for manufacturing glitches. Lego was designed so that every piece of Lego would fit with every other piece of Lego in the world that had either been built before or would come afterwards. That's a pretty ambitious project, but that's what we need to do with our content. So, the Lego stuff means that kids can make this pretty much with no instructions. There are instructions you can follow to build things with Lego, but equally, you know that if you pile enough Lego on top of each other, you're going to create something like this, which I think looks rather like the Winchester Mystery House, actually. So there we go, around the circle. But the point is this. The moulds and shapes are designed to fit together in multiple ways. Each piece is a discrete entity that combines. And this is what our content needs to do if it's going to travel everywhere. Structured chunks that make packages. I'm sure Karen is going to talk more to you about that tomorrow and how that specifically fits with what you do in Drupal. I want to talk about the Power Rangers. <laughs> because Power Rangers. How does this work with our content types, though? So imagine our Power Rangers, our amazing uh, elite fighting group in the fields of Kansas there, uh, or wherever else you get large amounts of wheat like that. Um, the Power Rangers combine together as one big mechanoid of awesome, right? You know shit's got real when the big robot trundles out. I'm sure you'll remember this on Saturday morning. But it's also worth remembering that the Power Rangers were an elite fighting team all of their own. So if you imagine our different content types, like the Red Ranger, he's the leader, always around. That's your text content. Then you've got video, that's yellow. Then you might have in infographic, because you like her a bit more than the others. That would be Pink Ranger, right? You shouldn't like her more than the others, but you kind of do, because... Oh, she's the one wearing the skirt, so that's pretty cool. Um, and all these things come together in different units to create a page or a section or a whatever you want to term that unit. It's this coming together of things. And then when you form your great big mechanoid of awesome, that's when your entire site is finished. That's all that stuff coming together. Now, no one takes a great big mechanoid of awesome and goes, how can I rip these things apart to form fi fighting kids? That's not the way round things go, OK? So anyway, back to our RPG. So how do you get your content strategy chops then? You can see where we're going with content, but how do we get to a point where we can do this? Well, first of all, you have to be a ninja. I mean, specifically, she was a thief, but we'll just ignore that because thief is a rubbish class. Um, we're just going to call her a ninja, much easier. So you need to audit a section. Take a bit. Look at it, think, what can I do with this? Don't make the problem too big. Look at what you can solve in one sprint or one section or one blob, whatever you're happy to do. Look at the microcopy, go down into real details. Work out what's in your terms and conditions and why are they there and can anyone understand them? Take the smallest unit you can and look to fix it. Mostly because you can seek forgiveness rather than ask permission. This is really useful when you're starting to look at content because as soon as you tell people you're going to change the navigation, the response is <laughs> whereas changing the navigation usually has a response of no one noticing for six months. It's useful. 
And it's generally how I get things done. So I start tracking a particular analytic number, or I start looking at a particular thing that I can assess. You have to be prepared to accept that you were wrong and some of your assumptions, because they will be assumptions at this point, because you won't be in a, you know, a state to do great, you know, solid research. But you can generally go on a gut feeling and look at something that you can change. And this becomes the thing that you use, the wedge that you use to start the process. So as an example, higher education, I've done some work with higher education. By the way, I noticed in the program they put this under um, like government, uh, higher education and non-profit. Um, I'm sorry if you're massively disappointed that this is not really that. I have done work in those areas, so if that helps. It should have been user experience, but still. Um, so some work that I've done with higher education, they tend to be really good at having the sort of drop downs on the homepage that are 20 things down and 13 across. Because everyone needs to be represented on the main page. It's very important so that you understand our place in the university. There's no way humanities could not be represented, you understand, right? And I work with British universities, so it is very much, very much people talking like this. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And I always feel like I'm back at school with all of them. So instead of asking permission because that was scary and I got a lot of nod nodding and, well, you understand the humanity is very important to the future of the university, I just started orphaning pages from the NAV. Because <laughs> it was easier to do. And I would take the pages, never changed. They bookmarked their own page and they went to them and they, they sent those bookmarks to other people in that field that wanted to see that particular stuff. They would email the link out to students for particular course notes. I just made sure they didn't appear on the main homepage. Record amount of time for someone not noticing was 19 months. <laughs> I'd actually left the project at that point and the project manager had to email me and say, do you know what happened with this link? <laughs> No idea, put it back on if you think it's useful. <laughs> so the point of this is to start self-assigning yourself tasks that you think will make a difference with the content because no one is going to give you that job. It's always someone else's job and it's never your job and that goes for everyone, therefore it's no one's job. So start self-assigning stuff that you think is going to make a difference because then you can start making a difference. Makes sense, right? I mean, that's literally how I got into this job of being a content strategist and originally a, a web copywriter. So my husband was a uh, web designer. Uh, he was the lead designer of Harrods of Knightsbridge. Ooh, which sounds very posh until you know that it was 2001. And so websites at that time were pretty rubbish, especially when they didn't really sell anything online and you know, they sent out a print catalog that was this big and the website was tiny. But anyway, that was what he did. And so it was very exciting when he left because he was able to put on his CV that he was you know, lead designer at Harrods of Knightsbridge. So some work came in, brilliant, but it was the sort of work that was like 800 pounds for an entire site. You know what it's like when you first get going, right? And so he would build these sites, they'd be okay. He was kind of learning about how to do CSS and stuff like that, so he didn't really mind that it wasn't bringing in too much money. What I really minded about, though, was the fact that the content on these sites was so dire, I wouldn't let him put them in his portfolio as they were. So I started rewriting the content for free. I didn't realize people would pay me for this. I didn't realize that was a job. So I just did this for about 10 sites. And then in the meantime, he went on to go and work for an agency, Clear Left, and they went, huh, you've got some skills doing this. Let's bring you in and do it. So there you go. That's how it turns out I got into this job by self-assigning because no one was going to pay for that then. They will do now. Oh, my, they pay. Oh, yes, they pay. <laughs> All right, then. So we've, we've achieved level one. We're moving on to level two. We've leveled up. Now you are a ranger. So you are now the one person that knows content strategy. Congratulations. You've joined the crew. You now officially have to know everything about content strategy. You know what I said at the beginning about it being okay to not know everything? Not with your clients. They now expect you to know everything. And all the people in your organization, as soon as you dabble, you're the content person. So the good news is that we're pretty much all of us making it up. There is no map for this. There's no way of knowing what the right thing to do is, or the best thing to do. There's some good things that you can do and some things we definitely recommend, but we are essentially all just making it up. So we're all on this path with no map, just some of us have cut further through the undergrowth. Or we have more oil in our lamps, if you like. The reason I bring this up with you is that our clients and our colleagues are terrified about this new world. There's a great opportunity there for them, but they didn't necessarily get into this to be publishers on the whole. So an example of this is I've worked with a, a quite famous pottery company in uh, the UK, 
Uh, they've been making uh, pottery for about 200 years. They've been making a website for approximately four. I can tell you which one they're much better at <laughs> because they didn't get into this to be website makers. Um, but what they're really passionate about is their pottery. So when you go and talk to them about the specification for the project and bits and pieces, their eyes kind of glaze over and you know they kind of think they know what they... Basically, they bought you in as a full service agency to fix all this stuff, right? But as soon as you start talking to them about the pottery and why they're into it, their eyes light up. They start telling you about how they select designs, about how they go about glazing things. And I went back to their site and none of this stuff was on their site. They just weren't telling the story. And that was what sold you on why you would pick their pottery over and above other pieces. Why would I have this you know, 700 pound dinner service over a 70 pound one I can buy in, in the department store? Why would I invest in buying these pieces? Because it is an investment. Not very few people can go out and go, brilliant, let's put the 700 pound dinner service down on the wedding list and expect to get it, right? And what usually happens is you get, you know, three dessert bowls and a soup tureen that you're never going to use and none of the other pieces. So they go in a cupboard to die. Um, that's kind of by the by. So the other thing we have to relate to these clients at this point is that content is not just this one amorphous blob. You don't sort of trowel this layer of content on the top of the site and have it seep like sediment into all the empty boxes you've left for it to fill. It's individual parts. It's contents, not content, like the contents of a book. So publishers see parts and consumers see the whole. The consumers understand that there's one author to a site. Now, they know there may be a range of voices, but they see that as one voice of a brand or whatever. But that doesn't necessarily have to be how that's created. So at this point, I am taking my clients through things like page tables. Now, a page table is a way of assessing what a piece of content is going to be. Not necessarily where it's going to live or whatever else, but what's the message of that piece of content? What's the method we're going to deliver that? Is it going to be text? in bullet points? Is it going to be a video guide? Is it going to be audio? Is it going to be a combination of things? And then what's the call to action? What do we want them to do with that? And so you might design this piece and alongside that you're saying who's responsible for that? Who's going to update it? Who's going to own it? What's the dependencies for that? So if you need to get source content out of someone in the pottery design department over there, but they're away for the next three weeks and your budget, you know, your timing means you have to do this in four, there's a problem there. And these are the kind of things that you're trying to sort out at this point before anyone goes ahead and commissions any content. So I do audits with them as well. Audits are character building. They are very good things for clients to do. I don't tell them about the tools that let them do it automatically at least not a first, because I think it's really important that they see that their shit stinks. <laughs> that they have produced this crap and it is live on their site, so that they are, are burning with fervor to make sure this never happens again, that they do design a workflow to mean that they get to take stuff off that's six months out of date and so on. And I break things down into smaller units as possible, so those individual one Lego pieces and show them how they come together. I actually literally take Lego in to show how that works. We label the pieces of Lego, we connect it together and we say, look, this is how it's gonna work on a mobile. This is how it's gonna work on a tablet. And then this might be how it works on your desktop. But equally, we could strip all this crap back because look, it looked quite well in the mobile version, right? So why don't we focus for what's going on there? It depends on the client and what we're doing, but that really helps them get their head around the fact that these content bits come together and we're not looking at a singular page, that there's like a page table and then we flick over to the next page and so on. But a page table, I mean, I could really re rename it a unit table or something, but it allows us to think about an, a discrete piece of content. Okay, so message, method, call to action is what I'm doing there. Right, fantastic, we're going to level up again, look at us. So now you've got into this kind of thing about talking about, well, we're going to create pieces of content and they're going to slot together and they're going to be able to be reused in multiple places and this is really important. You are now leading a team into organizational change because that fundamentally changes the way a lot of businesses work. They're usually sat in big silos where marketing is doing one bit, accounting is doing something else, and what you might need is to have representatives and teams from all these places and ideally a multidisciplinary team working on it to bring about this change. It's a substantial change to a lot of organizations to think in this way. Once clients can see content on a small level, then you start building the pile. And then they're suddenly publishers. And that means you have to maintain a level of stuff. <coughs> Excuse me.
And at this point, you need to be stepping up and defending the people that make this stuff. The content creators that have to work with, in this case, Drupal, day in, day out. Ask them what they need. Ask them what you can do to make that experience better for them. Make an environment for them that they can create the best stuff in. And you might find that the writing environment that they want to create things is not in Drupal, but they want to bring stuff in. I'm a firm believer that most content management systems are excellent at managing content and shit at making it. Because that's not where people do their best work. They do their best work stripped away from those distractions that you find when you're working on a screen. You want them to be able to work in the way that they work best. Now, if they do work best in a, in a, a WYSIWYG or whatever, well, fine, I'm not going to stop them. But that shouldn't be the assumption that that's the way writers work best. And that's just something we force on them. Equally, if you're going to give them a number of different fields, like short, medium, long titles or so on, explain what those fields are for, otherwise they'll just leave the fields empty. Because if you got presented with 21 different fields that you had to fill in and you didn't know why, you wouldn't bother filling them in either, because that's what humans do. So at this point, you have to lead the cavalry. It's a big ask, but content strategies are organization changes. Essentially, I spend 20% of my time working with content and 80% of my time in meetings explaining what I'm doing with the content. It's not a great balance for me, but it's one that has to exist at the moment. But once people see the results of level one and level two, they'll trust you. You become sort of their consultant as well as their employee, their go-to person to go and ask stuff. Content often has to be more than the things that we think of. It often has to be the customer service, the sales, the marketing, the voice on the board, and lots more things get pulled in and out of this content ecosystem. People that want to be involved and people that you have to talk to. And even the raging orc in accounting who doesn't want you to spend money on making extra stuff, you need to go and talk to them about why these changes are necessary. What's coming in in the future? Why do you need them to push through this idea of paying for monthly subs for services that they're so resistant to doing? Because it makes what you're doing better. So when I say it touches every part of the organization, I have literally sat in accounting you know, um, departments explaining to them why I really need a subscription to Trello that we have to pay monthly for and why we can't just have it as a purchase order and why there isn't anything suitable to replace that and why it's so important. Once you get everyone on board to see the vision, that's easier, but you're never going to get everyone on board. Even there'll be some point people when you're, you've fully integrated the system and you're pushing it out will be going, but oh, I just preferred the way it was the way last time we had it. Fine. Don't see the problem. Don't see why we had to do it. I have that now in my job currently, regularly. You know, and that's just something I have to live with that I know the long-term goal will make the short-term pain better. All right, level four wizard. So we're getting into the deep stuff now. This is where you have to future-proof your work. Content is no longer sign off, push out. It's orbital. It exists beyond your control to a certain extent. Um, I mean, obviously, we have stuff that we'll host and have in Drupal, but there'll be things that people put on YouTube and put on Twitter and so on, and these are all things that we have to consider. There's never just the one, you know, one system to rule them all. It's never going to be like that again. Creating an editorial process means that you can do magic things like repackage content because it becomes platform agnostic, searchable, findable, templatable, measurable. At this point, if you've tackled the other things and your organization is ready to roll with that kind of stuff, you'll start, you're ready to start pushing at some of the really difficult questions that we're going to tackle now. So Erin Consane, um, an amazing content strategist, I created this list that I'm going to talk about now in about 2010. It's still the kind of Bible go-to. When I talk to clients about what I'm aiming to do with their content, they often think that I'm going to say, make it friendly and short and chippy and exciting and engaging. And it's not, it's not any of those things. I hope those things come out of it. That, that would be useful. But the things that I'm really looking to do with their content are the things you'll find in this list. So accessible. Accessible for us as uh, designers and developers comes with a certain amount of weight, I know. But in terms of accessibility, as well as the usual things we think about, I'm thinking of things like a Bible in your language, a set of instructions at the literacy level that you need as a user, a design created for all audiences to use and also access in a physical sense, and something that's able to adapt to your needs based on location. So as an example for that, when I did some work for the UK government on GovUK, uh, the single domain site, we were thinking about what to do if you lost your passport, which is quite a, a common task that citizens have to do and can only do via government. 
Um, and so one of the things we knew is that you had to fill in a form and take, usually take that to your local post office where it's ratified, sent off to the passport office. So what was currently being presented was a drop-down list of all the post offices in the UK. We're a bit obsessed with post offices. It was quite a long list. So what we did was po postcode lookup to present you with the nearest post office to you. You could still access all the post offices that offered the passport service, but the default that it would give you as far as it could was where's the nearest post office to you and here's the Google walk walking directions to it because people are usually within walking distance of their post office if they live in a town. But if we couldn't recognize where they were, we would then default to giving them that list, uh, which was kind of useful, I thought, and it seemed pretty popular with our users. So searchable is another one. So a book has a table of contents and an index and things like that. Web stuff is search. If we're really lucky, search within a page. Ooh. Internal search is one of the most neglected areas for content, and it's a massive frustration when you're trying to find one thing quickly. I think we've all been in that situation where you're like, I know it's on this damn page somewhere, but it's not picking up. And this goes hand in hand with findable. So we have in information sciences, things like the uh, Dewey Decimal System and libraries, bibliographies, and other library sciences like that have defined how we list and record information in all formats. On the web, we have trusty URLs, but we're starting to make a hash of those. And the follow-up is some slightly arcane tricks to play on search engines. Cracking this stuff, the findable is the next nut, and the answer might lie in open link data and the concept of orbital content, uh, which I advise you go look up if you haven't uh, come across it before. Desirable. Desirable content is pretty important to us as well. See, people need to want it, but they also need to know that they want it. So, so far, we have, uh, on the web, we have app stores over here and thrashing it out on search engines for places over there. But sharing via social media is picking up pace. And uh, if curated, collectly, trusted sources to use can find us the con content we want. So presenting well-selected collections is important and knowing the psychology behind those. There's a reason that Apple on their screen, even when they went to the iPad, didn't start, they could have fitted six groups of icons on there, but they went for four because four is easy to scan and understand. It's the same with curated collections of books. One of the things that Amazon has done is tested pages and numbers of books. And if you put things in groups of four, people will scan across and make a selection. They also know that if you, if you put them in the middle two, you're more likely to buy those. Creepy, but it does work. So presenting well-selected collections is important, and it's why I can spend hours in an actual good physical bookstore, right? It's the idea of walking around and the potential of finding stuff that you didn't know was there is one of the hardest things for us to do. Shareable. So back when Erin made this list um, in 2010, the Wired iPad app had recently launched in the previous five months, and she was asked to do some research about it because it hadn't done as well as they hoped. Um, initially, the iPad app for the Wired magazine um, was free and then reduced price for the next three. And after that, they were expecting subscriptions to drop off, but not completely flatline as they did. So they did some research. And people kept describing it as dead. Isn't that a weird word to use to describe an app? But it's because the content was literally trapped under the glass. At the time, you couldn't select or copy and paste, and you couldn't share. It was like a golden PDF on a $400 device. Um, that's actually less useful than the magazine. Like the magazine, you can like rip out a page and post it. You can fold it up and hit it over the top of the head of the editor that decided making it non-searchable would be good. If your content can't travel as easily as sending something by snail mail, what is the point of it? You've kind of lost the grip of what you should be doing with that content. Selectable. So encyclopedias are in multi-volume volumes, uh, chapters of a book, we have anchor points in a recording, newspaper clippings, and selectable sections of computerized text. Ah! Our current technology has a disconnect between the person creating and the per and pushing live the content and the receiver. So it's easy to forget this is actually a relationship between two people. And Drupal and other CMSs like it are the intermediary that should assist with those conversations, one to another. If the CMS is getting in the way of people being able to do that, that's where we run into problems. So 
The other point is the receiver is the point of that content, and they should be f have the freedom to repurpose, save, and annotate, you know, within fair use, uh, stuff as they wish. So when Ken Kindle introduced annotations, I, had, I did a little dance, not unlike my thank you dance I did earlier, um, because it makes it massively use useful to someone like me who reads lots of textbooks, because not only can I annotate my own stuff, but I can see what other people have annotated, which, again, helps make a connection between you and other people in a way there wasn't there before. Do you know what's also awesome about that? If you're prepared to spring the $2 on a copy of Twilight, you can see all the things that teenage girls moon over. It's so cute. Because <laughs> they don't realize you can see all the public annotations. It's really adorable. And then Fifty Shades of Grey came out and it got creepy. <laughs> Self-aware. So within the history of the book and its content, self-aware probably meant cross-reference. So you think of dictionaries and references in encyclopedias that can push to other sections of the book and biographies that cite bits. They are aware that those things exist. So on the web, our content can also do this. It's not called the web for nothing. Uh, but beyond that, it's really about ensuring our content is tagged, linked, and generally available to other sources. Now, when I said I don't know a lot about all the areas of content strategy, this is one that I don't know that much about and I'm just exploring. But, um, so for me as a content strategist, the things that I went to go look at as a start is the work of uh, Rachel Lovinger at Razorfish, um, who wrote a thing called the Nimble Content Report a couple of years ago that's excellent, and also checking out the main hub of linkeddata.org. Um, which, again, has lots of ideas, and this is a new area and things that we're looking at, but the idea of content, talking to other content, and being aware of what that is. Stuff around recipes and uh, sites being able to pull in recipes of particular lengths and things like that. It's exciting, interesting stuff. So portable content, totable, carry aroundable. Up until now, we've been really limited by that damn physics stuff. It's like really got in the way of carrying around the whole of the British Library, hasn't it? But now, with handheld... Well, the, I guess the first step down from that was when you had like stone tablets, and it was like, bloody hell, these stone tablets are really hard to carry around. I'm going to invent a scroll. And like, oh my god, these scrolls burn quickly. I'm going to invent a book. And then I'm going to invent this huge book that has to be copied out by hand, because that will work. No, I'm going to invent a handheld Bible that can be printed. And, and, so, and so it goes on. And increasingly, till we get to this point where we ha now have a small physical disk that allows us to take pretty much everything with us. There was a, uh, an article I read recently saying that in, within three years, at this point, uh, the storage will be cheap enough that for about £50, you could carry enough, around enough storage for every movie ever made. So then we get to the licensing issues. <laughs> Ownership of that digital space and access is a whole other question that we're going to have to tackle. And we're going to have to talk to our clients about who owns that content and who can do what with it. What's fair use? What does copyright mean now? What happens if someone copies all our stuff? How do we deal with that as a response? And these are the kind of questions that clients are now going to come at you with because, you know, you're, you do the content management system right, so this comes under your domain. Welcome to my world. Flexible. So we've defined that the content could be infinite, but the conduit must adapt so that we can select what we want on any device, anywhere. I want you to pack that whole library up for me and put it on this disk. Our limitations are now in the repackaging of that data, where we're going to present it. It's like the space elevator. It's the hardest job you ever have to do once is formatting all that content, stri stripping it out and making it as pure as you can so that you can add chunks round the side to put it where it needs to go, rather than that being inserted into the content. So our job now is to strip out all that stuff and have this you know, content that's as pure as the driven snow uh, and not have people come walk over it with muddy boots the moment it starts snowing. Okay. Well done us, we've achieved level five. That's as far as we're going today, I'm afraid. I'm not taking us all the way up to level 30. Um, so now you can make small changes, big changes, organizational scale changes, and even perform magic, moving content from one device to another. You are a commodity. Congratulations, you are valuable. You have valuable, transferable, flexible skills. You might start looking for bigger challenges. And Drupal, I think in particular, really needs some strong content advocates to talk more about this stuff. So I'm here. 
Karen's going to be here tomorrow. We're going to talk about this stuff now. What I really don't want is for the door to slam us and, and for you guys to go, well, that was academically interesting, wasn't it? I, I thought so too. I like the way they talked about chunks and blobs. Yes, I thought that was very good. This stuff is coming and it's going to come slap you in the face. Now, here's the thing. Not very many other CMSs are ready for this either. I actually think Drupal's in a pretty good position in terms of structured content, but it just needs to be more widely known within the community as to what the goals and aims of that are. So if you guys can get this right, you will be light years ahead of any competition. That can only be good, right? That's what we want. So I would really beg you that even if you don't think this is something you need to know that much about, invest some time in learning a little more because your clients really need to know a lot more about it. It's their content that's going to get you know, stuck, basically. And they're going to blame you for, for recommending Drupal if Drupal can't handle this and then you won't get the work again. Okay, so this is the bit where you start forming your own party. Congratulations, you're now the dungeon master. So when I said that there's, there's people that know different areas of content strategy, we come together as teams. Like We're like left for dead, the CS edition. So we have like our library scientist and our data visualization girl and our editor extraordinaire. And we come together as a power team to create all this amazing content. And we travel in packs. You should hire us. We're really good at this. But more than that, you should have these little packs going in Drupal as well. Someone that can join each project, each bit that's going on, each movement, and go, so how does this affect people in terms of the actual content that we're managing? and the making of that content, the maintaining of that content, and the success of that content for the business. It's really important. Solving these big problems, again, puts you light years ahead of the competition. I'm here in part because I want to know more about what Drupal can do for me, because I very rarely get to recommend Drupal to clients, because it's really hard for me to show that Drupal does the things that I want it to do, because out of the box, it doesn't. And I understand why that is, but I really wish there was a way that I could do it as a non-technical person. I understand launching Drupal and getting it going is not like a, you know, it's deliberately not like WordPress and I completely accept that. However, the people I have to sell it to are not developers. I have to show that it can do the stuff I want it to do with the content. And I am happy to talk till the cows come home about the problems that I face if uh, people want to either catch me afterwards or catch me tomorrow to talk about it. Okay. So... I think we've pretty much come towards the end. So I should tell you, I do teach online classes uh, on content strategy. I also do in-house workshops for businesses uh, where I come in for a day or two days and go through some of this stuff that we talked about and also do some practical stuff, like show you how to do a content audit and what I want to get out of that. Um, and the, the courses, basically, you can then apply them to your own projects. You, you get handouts or presentations, tasks. We have a little chat room, all that kind of stuff. And yes, you do get a unicorn in the first episode. I made very clear of that. So um, I'd like to say thank you for coming to my talk. And just before I finish, there's something really important I want to tell you, which is not related to me, but is related to this. So uh, there's going to be a FEMA rep. Is that, did I say that right? Uh, yeah. Uh, and they're going to come here to brief you guys about um, the Oklahoma tornado disaster response. They are looking to create uh, a site, uh, well, several sites in fact, um, and they want your help and they, they want to move on this fast. So at 7.30 tonight, there is going to be a meeting to discuss this initial stuff. It is in the Coders Lounge in the Doubletree Hotel. Um, and it says here, we will be working to help the victims and emergency responders on the ground. We want to develop a website that will co coordinate the transportation and help deal with housing issues. We want to, want to organize four teams with the goals of creating apps that will help with these problems and that will drive people to our website portal. So that's tonight at 7.30 in the Double Tree Coders Lounge. Uh, if you want to find out more information, bit.ly slash Drupal4OK uh, and the hashtag Drupal4OK. And that's pretty much me done. So yeah, see you at the tabletop. Thank you. Um, I think I have time to take some questions, but equally if you want to come grab me afterwards and ask questions, that's cool. I would ask that you don't ask me anything too specific about Drupal, because you'll just get this look. <laughs> there we go. I, I have a question. Hey. Um, so you're talking a lot about content strategy within an organization. And a lot of us do 
a lot of us here do work for organizations, but a lot of us here work for agencies. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that uh, a lot of Drupal agencies are very programmer centric. I'm a user experience person and I have to fight to even get to be able to do user experience. And it's only been in the last year that I think like Drupal has been like, oh yeah, user experience, we gotta think about this for the sure. last few years. So it's really hard to get our programmer people who are like, I want to build this feature and build this feature and code this to think about the content. Mm -hmm. So I just did, I was wondering, you know, what's your experience in um, in the agency world? At what point in the project do you say we need budget for this to write the yeah. content? We need to get these people involved and so on. So um, I guess. The thing with this as a conversation, let me think. So when I get involved, it's because someone has recognized a problem, right? Usually it's because the shit has splattered all over the fan and right back in their face. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's usually some cleaning up to do on that front. But the other thing that I try and do is work in multidisciplinary teams. So I try and sit with a designer on one side of me and a developer on the other, and we work together on a problem. Because the developer can usually fix stuff that I'm trying to fix with like writing out content and he's like, well, you know, we can just make that work at the back end and like, identify this and make it work. That is the best way to solve that problem. So the first thing to, to work on, I think, is getting parity within your organization of the amount of people on each thing as far as possible. The other thing about content in that thing um, is I often talk about the fact that developers and designers to a certain extent have uh, computers on their side to do a lot of the heavy lifting for them. I just have my brain, and it doesn't do a lot of heavy lifting. So in terms of like working in sprints and stuff like that, I try and work as far forward in a sprint as possible. So that I, so if they're working on sprint two, I'm already thinking about what's going on in sprint three and have delivered the content that I want them to play with in sprint two. Now, I might iterate on that content as we go. I keep half an eye on it. But I try and keep myself as far ahead as possible so they're dealing with real stuff, and I'm not trying to fix those problems. Um, the reason Waterfall d development existed is that it was easier to go one step at a time. So you kind of have to um, accept that actually trying to write the content and develop the content and design the content all at once, is a, that's a hard way to start. So giving everyone a little stagger within that, um, so everyone keeps within the sprint times, but they're not necessarily within, which I know goes fundamentally against the way that Agile is meant to work, but it's the only way I've ever got good content out of that situation. So parity and giving the content creators and the UX people enough space to do the stuff they need to do. In terms of getting budget for it, again, it's a case of try and start small with a thing that you can demonstrate the value of, show how much it costs, and show the return on investment, and keep hammering it home to everyone. So when you do show and tells, and the programmers are saying, I've just built this, and it's fantastic, your show and tell is, I've just done this, and it saved us this amount of money, because we, we ran over this error, and slowly over time it comes in. The other thing I do is I try and put as much of the, the content uh, designing stuff I'm doing in with the developer's tools. So whereas if they're using a bug tracker, I also use the bug tracker. I will put all my stuff in there. And so it also means in terms of typos and mistakes, rather than it just being my pair of eyes looking on that, I've got however many people are in that team going, because everyone can spot a typo, right? But they don't necessarily know if it's their right to change it or if it's going to be changed in a different version or something. Again, put it in the bug tracker, exactly the same as you would do with any coding error, and that really helps. Cool. Thank okay. you. Hi. We can do a duet. Yeah. So my understanding is that uh, we have assets, business logic, and then a display layer. And in the assets, we have the content. And it seems to me that the content is pretty close to plain text in the context in which we're speaking. No, it'd be all content. So does that extend out to then image assets, video yeah. assets, yeah. and also cooked eggs like PDF files yeah. and PowerPoints? Yeah. I see. All of okay. the above and more. Okay. Th that was actually my question. That's okay. No, I'm glad no. to answer it so conclusively. It's not very often I can be so firm. Okay, go on. One last question. Go on, 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 go on. Yay! Ladies and gentlemen, it's Mr. Jeff Eaton. Woo! I, I was actually just wondering if you've considered converting your talk to D20. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, <laughs> hey.
<laughs> Seriously, though. Um, um, mm. Okay. Hey, Mr. So one, so one thing that we're dealing with is trying to do like the first initial just inventory stage on sites with like literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of content. Yep. The purist in me says that I want to develop, I want to like use automated tools to go through and like scan stuff. At what point do you just make the judgment call and say when we're figuring out what we've got here, you know, we're just going to pick representative examples. Yeah, when I see 10, 10 or so repeats of stuff, like when I'm going cross-eyed seeing the same sort of thing over and over and over, that tends to be uh, the point at which I'm going, okay, I understand what this content type is and what it's doing. Um, the other thing I do if I get something that I'm not sure whether it breaks down into individual assets too easily is I look at the individual units. So a good example for this is a recipe. You can look at a recipe as a whole, uh, and all the things that are go into a recipe are what make it a recipe. It's not a recipe without all of these things, but there are discrete units there. So there's, here are the list of ingredients. Here's the step-by-step -step instructions. Here's the temperature you need to set the oven. Here's the equipment that you'll need to do that. And then that might also have accompanying it video assets or photo assets or a gallery or even audio, any of those things. All those things together form that particular recipe. Now, some of them are necessary for it to be a recipe and some of them are extra to the recipe. And so that then helps us work out what that structure is and what we need to prioritize finding out. But so an, with an example of a recipe site, I wouldn't go looking at 500 individual recipes. I would look at what goes to make up a recipe page and what assets I'll be managing. And then I'll go into the content audit and go, okay, so. I've got 500 recipes and 100 of those from these files I can tell are, are videos that accompany recipes. I don't necessarily have to see all those individual videos, but um, again, it's the sort of thing that I then put into the bug tracker. So if someone spots a recipe file that's got a video and the video is not working, they can tell me that that asset is not working and I can go in and then try and work out what we're going to do and fix that. Did that vaguely answer your question? Awesome. All right, I really need a beer. Anyone else? <laughs> Woohoo! Um, so I'd just like to say thank you very much um, to, to DrupalCon for having me come here. Uh, it's been really cool, and I look forward to learning more from you over the next few days. Thanks.